Banky Wellington. Olubankole Banky W. Wellington is a multi talented and prolific singer, songwriter, actor, filmmaker, businessman, motivational speaker, master of ceremony, politician, and philanthropist. Banky W holds a bachelor's degree in industrial engineering from the very prestigious Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. While still in university, he started Empire Mates Entertainment, EME label, and later discovered and developed successful music artists such as Wizkid and Skills, amongst others. Banky W is currently co CEO and marketing creative director of Suya Bistro with plans to create one of the fastest growing and most in-demand quick service restaurant chains in Nigeria. In 2018, Banky Wellington made an inspiring foray into the world of Nigerian politics as a candidate of the Modern Democratic Party for the House of Representatives in Etiosa, Lagos. Without the backing of any major party or sponsor, Banky ran one of the most inspiring campaigns ever seen by a political candidate in the country and inspired a generation of Nigerian youth to get involved in rebuilding Nigeria to be the kind of country they desire. He launched the Banky Wellington organization through which he spearheads or partners with numerous charitable and impactful initiatives. He has evolved over the years into becoming arguably the most versatile entertainment and media mogul on the continent of Africa. Banky W tied the knot with the love of his life, Nollywood actress Adesua Itomi Wellington in 2017. Uh, I got to say something um, before I start. You know, as you can see, I got my Super Eagles jersey on. I really came close to wearing my Arsenal jersey, but the Holy Spirit advised me against it because we don't want Chelsea fans to be depressed. So I decided <laughs> we're pretty much mostly Nigerians here. I'm going to go with the Niger jersey so everybody can stick around. Shout out to y'all, Chelsea. I know you're missing that FA Cup this year. It's okay. Um, speaking of football, uh, some of my guys from my football group are here, some of my close friends are here, and some of my family members are here, people that have known me for a very long time, my day one people, um, if, if you will, are here. So thank you guys for, for tuning in today. Um, you know, it's crazy when I say my day one people are here. If you had asked any of my guys, or even myself, five or ten years ago, that, or if you had told us that in, in five to ten years' time, I, Banky W, would be speaking about morality from a spiritual perspective at a man's conference, we probably all would have laughed in your face and called you crazy. I mean, we're talking about the, the former king of the Lagos party. I mean, we would have thought you were out of your mind. Um, first of all, I mean, everybody here knows I spent most of my career um, as a musician. And in that time, I made a lot of songs uh, about women, uh, for women, or to get with women. Now, don't get me wrong, there's, there are songs and videos that I'm very proud of till this day, but there are songs where I look back now and you know, I look at the videos and I'm just, you know, I cringe just a little bit because uh, you know, I, I definitely crossed some lines in terms of being suggestive or sexually suggestive. And I mean, this is a men's conference, this is a, a safe zone, so we're just gonna be very honest today. Um, and I know that for people who know me or people who've seen me over the years, kind of watching the position that I'm in now is, is difficult for some people to kind of come to terms with. And it's funny, whenever I post uh, you know, a message from church or sorry, maybe a leadership conference, you always see somebody be like, ah, is this guy a pastor? No being seeing Jassy, no being seeing the bad girl come and wipe on the thing and all, and all of this stuff. Um, and it's, it's crazy because, especially for my close friends, people who've been kind of up close and personal with me over the years, They've seen me at my worst uh, behavior, you know, at my lowest moral ground or my, my lowest moral standings, if you will. In fact, last Sunday, a friend of mine actually tuned in uh, to the Waterbrook service where I was speaking. And after the service, he sent me a message and he said, Banky, please, how did you do it? How did you go from being a very worldly person that I know to being this completely spiritual guy? I mean, because he'd seen me in clubs, he'd seen me on tour, he'd seen me at after parties, standing on tables and pouring alcohol down people's throats. He'd seen me with many women on overtime. And so it's, it's, I can understand the shock, right? And I think it's from that place that I'm going to be speaking today. Um, how does somebody go from being the life of the party in that sense to 
quote unquote speaking life from the pulpit. And I gotta be honest with you guys. I mean, I'm here to talk about man versus morality. And that's a battle that I'm very familiar with because today's man faces battles in everything from alcohol to substance and drug abuse to prom promiscuity to pornography. Um, some men are struggling with domestic violence in their homes or emotional violence against themselves, also known as depression, like Larry spoke about. And that's what we're going to talk about today, but we're going to talk about it from a spiritual perspective. And so in this, my setup of the discussion, I'm going to try and quickly get through, excuse me, I'm going to try and quickly get through three questions that I want everybody to seriously consider. And, I, and if you can, please take some notes, you know, write it down, you know, and definitely engage in the chat room. Um, but I'm going to take three questions and I'm going to give you three suggestions or three answers. And hopefully I can get through all of these before my, my time is up and then we'll get into Q&A where we can talk about it a little bit more. All right. So um, I'm going to start by opening the Bible to John. And if you have a Bible app, this is a good time to whip it out. We're going to go to John chapter five from verse one to five. I'm going to read from the NIV actually. Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate at a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five colored and covered colonnades. Here, a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. I'm gonna to go to verse six. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? And that's the first question that I have for the guys on the call today. The question is, and this is the first point for today, do we want to be well? Do we want to get well? This is a story about Jesus and the blind man by the pool. And this guy had been there 38 years. So the Bible tells us that there was a whole community of people with issues by that pool. Um, the legend had it that every once in a while an angel would come down and stir the water and then if you were the first to get into the water maybe you'd get you know healed of your circumstance so so there ended up being this growing community of people who were sick or paralyzed or blind or with some issue or another sitting in this community by the pool now since they all pretty much lived there I bet that they had friendships I bet some of them were, were friends with each other some of them were close to each other they were just used to themselves and the issues and the circumstances that surrounded them. Now, maybe some had a faint, distant hope that they'd be lucky enough to get into the pool one day when the angel is stirring the water. But that really wasn't realistic for a lot of them. This man, for instance, was an invalid. He was paralyzed. So there's no way this man would ever get into the water ahead of anybody else. So for a lot of them, they had accepted their fate and their state of being, so much so that when Jesus came to this man, the man didn't even realize that God was standing right in front of him, ready to rescue him and set him free. He was so used to his condition that he couldn't see that his breakthrough was around the corner. Do you, do you ever realize that in prisons, right? In prisons, there's usually no window to the outside world, or if there is, it's so small, so that your vision for, for the world that exists beyond your imprisonment is so limited because they don't want the prisoner to see the, to, to start having dreams of breaking free. They don't want you to, to see the possibilities that exist beyond the prison. And that's what bondage does. That's how it operates. It wants you limited in that bondage, in that place, in that circumstance, in that struggle, in that slave, in that sin that you're a slave to. It wants you to stay there. And bondage always attacks your vision. So that when even God himself is standing in front of you, asking you this question, you can't even see it. And that's how it works. Now, <clears throat> that's the first question for today. You've been carrying this sickness for so long. You've been carrying, and everybody on this call, I don't care who you are, there's something that you're struggling with. It could be, maybe you're an alcoholic, maybe you're a drug addict, maybe you are promiscuous, maybe you're addicted to porn, maybe you're emotionally unavailable, maybe you're depressed, maybe you're stuck in a rut. There's something that every single man on this call is dealing with. Some of it is public that other people know. Some of it, you're the only person in this world. It's only you and God that knows that you're dealing with. But the question that God is asking first and foremost is when you come to terms with this issue, do you want to be well? And if you read that chapter further, you see that the man, when Jesus asked him the question, the man 
instead of just saying, yes, I want to be well, the man started saying, oh, uh, I, I, I've never been able to. He started finding every reason because he couldn't see that the solution was around the corner. So that's the first question. Do you want it? Because it's not enough for God to want it for you. You have to want it from yourself, for yourself. So do you want to be healed from this sickness? I know you've been a slave to that sin for forever, but do you want to be free? Do you actually want your breakthrough? Okay, you have to want it for yourself. You have to want that freedom from alcohol or drug dependency. You have to want that freedom from, from pornography. You have, to want, you have to see beyond the chains of lust and promiscuity that have held you back and ruined your relationship or your marriage for so long. So that's the first question. Do you want to be well? Second question, this is something that everybody really needs to consider. Are you compromising for a counterfeit? In other words, have you believed a lie? Have you become comfortable in, a, in your circumstances? See, here's the thing. The devil, the enemy, Satan, whatever you want to call him, he will always make a counterfeit offer to you, just like fake medicine. I mean, we live in Nigeria. Everybody hears stories of, you know, fake drugs. And NAFDAQ is always on the offensive trying to, to stamp these things out from the market. Because counterfeits, sooner or later, will kill you. The Bible says the thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But what we don't realize is that the devil needs your permission to do that. He needs your own permission to give him access to put these chains on. And so he will always make you that offer. He will make a suggestion, but it's up to you whether you believe it and you accept it or not. In Genesis um, chapter 3, verse 1 to 5, and this is where you know, the serpent came to tempt Eve. He came with a real slick, slick suggestion. He said to Eve, he said, hey, the first thing that he asked, and you go back and read it. I don't, I don't really have time to read all of the verses here. But the, the serpent, the devil, comes to Eve and he says, hey, did God really say that uh, you shouldn't eat of, this, of any tree in the garden? That's exactly what he said. He said, did God really say you shouldn't eat of any tree in the garden? Because he's trying to get her to accept suggestions. He's trying to get her to doubt the word of God, the promise of God for her. And then she says, oh, well, no, God didn't say of any tree. He said, oh, just not of this tree. And then he says, hey, let me tell you why God doesn't want you to eat of this tree. Because if you do it, you'll be like God. Well, here's the scam. Like Larry already told us, man was already created in the image and likeness of God. So there was no one and nothing in the entire universe that was more like God than man. And yet here comes the devil trying to sell man a scam, sell man a scam that, hey, if you do this, you'll be like God. Well, guess what? I'm already like God. There's nobody more like God than me in the entire universe. But that's what the enemy does. He comes and he makes you a counterfeit offer. He offers you something that is a counterfeit version of what God has already made provision for, for you. Something you already have in God. And so in order to deal with your issues, he'll want to get you drowned in alcohol, for instance. He'll want to get you to depend on spirits, alcoholic spirits, instead of the spirit of God. Can we be real here? I mean, we're, we're amongst men. He will want you to accept side chicks over your marriage. He will want to offer you despair and depression instead of determination to make it out of your circumstance. Because God's plan is always about purpose, but the devil's counterfeit offer will always lead to pain. If you go to uh, Matthew chapter four, verse one to 11, again, I'm not gonna read it because of time. Even when the devil came to tempt Jesus, he came with the same strategy of offering a counterfeit. He said, hey, if you're the son of God, turn these stones into bread. Did Jesus have the power to do that? Absolutely. He said, hey, you know what? Let's go on top of this, this high place. You know what? Jump down. The angels will bear you up. You will not get hurt. He's, he's making suggestions. He's making counterfeit offers. Because that's his style. That's how he does it. And the reason he does that is because he actually needs your own permission to imprison you. The devil cannot force bondage on you. But he can suggest something, a counterfeit offer, that if you accept, you open that door. It's kind of like opening your door in your house for an armed robber to come in, right? Now, the armed robber's name is not on the lease of the house. So he cannot, the armed robber doesn't come into your house and say, okay, now I own this house. No, but if you leave your gates open, if you leave your door open at night and you have no security in a place like Lagos, sooner or later, somebody's gonna sneak in. Now, even though his name is not on the lease, for as long as he's in that house, 
He's, he controls a part of that house. He controls a part of what belongs to you. And so it's the same concept. Nobody starts out as an alcoholic. Nobody starts out addicted to drugs. Domestic violence doesn't start overnight. It doesn't start suddenly. Nobody starts out as a serial cheater or addicted to porn. It starts small. Maybe you, you watch a video someday and then you watch another video or something and you put one foot in front of the other. Maybe you have a great night out party and the next day you're a bit hungover and then you have another night. It's always gradual, you know? Um, and then, you know, with alcohol, I mean, I, I, there was a point in my life where to catch any kind of a buzz, I had to go through at least over half a bottle of Ciroc or Hennessy just to, to feel a buzz. And of course, I didn't start that way, but you know, it's putting one foot in front of the other. For some of us, maybe the first time you smoke weed, three, four hits, you are okay, you are out like a light. And then the next time, it takes more than that for you to feel any kind of a buzz. And then some people wake up a short while down the road, it might be weeks, might be months, might be years. But you wake up one day and you realize you cannot be productive if you don't smoke. You can't be creative. A lot of artists wake up in the morning and the first thing they need to do for them to be able to function is to take marijuana. And if they don't do it, they're useless. And that's what the devil does is he tempts you with something. And it may not look like a big deal in the beginning, but you start putting one foot in front of the other and you wake up one day and you realize that you've gone so far from where you were supposed to be, where God created you to be. Um, <clears throat> maybe you turn to, to promiscuity to deal with the pain of rejection. Some guys, you know, you, you know, a girl breaks your heart. I'm a living testimony of this. You go through something, you have a bad experience with a woman, and then you say, you know what? I will never allow myself to be hurt like this again. So instead of being hurt, you now want to be the one that's dishing it out. So you take that pain and, you know, you ever hear the phrase hurt people, hurt people? You now go out and start trying to find flimsy physical relationships with men because, uh, with women because you don't want to experience that pain of being hurt again. And then you start becoming promiscuous. And then from being promiscuous, you now think, ah, oh, I don't want to catch a disease or I don't want to get him pregnant. You now start saying, man, I'm sexually active. I need something. I need something. So you accept the, su the suggestion of pornography. And then you start watching porn. Now, all of a sudden, from running away from that pain, you have, you have gone to being promiscuous. You have now gone to being addicted to porn. You are now dealing with all kinds of problems. For some guys, maybe as a little boy, you, you cried your eyes out when you saw your dad beating your mom. And it planted that seed in you. And then you grow up to despise your father, but worse, you grow up to become him. You know, and, and that's how it starts. It starts in the place of acceptance. It starts in the place of compromising for a counterfeit. And then for a lot of us, we now, especially in a place like Nigeria and Africa, we now get to the place where we just accept that. We say things like, that's how men are. Some people believe that men just beat their wives. They saw their, their fathers do it. Their fathers saw their grandfather do it. And you just believe that that's the way it is. Or that a real man has many women. A lot of us have grew up with that stereotype that, you know, if a man has a lot of women, you know, he's a player, he's a G, you know, um, or that a man is supposed to be able to convince of, or make a woman sleep with him. And then we wonder why we have problems with sexual assault. Or you're not a man if you don't have an extremely high tolerance for alcohol or drugs or whatever it is. Or you're not a man if you feel any kind of emotion or display any kind of emotion. And then we, we cut ourselves off emotionally. Maybe, maybe you are somebody that's just been stuck in a place for so long that you just feel like, man, this is who I am. I'm just going to be a failure. I'm never going to make it out of this situation. And that's what the devil wants. He wants you to get into that place of acceptance, of compromising for a counterfeit, of just accepting that circumstance for who you are. Bondage is a big problem that always starts small. That's the second question. Now, the third question. How am I doing on time, Pastor Sam? Am I okay? Can I keep going? Yeah, yeah, you're doing good. You've got about uh, probably right. another five, ten minutes tops. Yeah. All right, let me try and zip through this. All right, okay. here we go. Here's the third question. Are you ready to deal with the roots? Are you ready to deal with the roots? Guys, the, the root cause of most addictions is pain. Okay, it's, it's, this is why, I mean, I'll give you an example, just a very normal physical example. When somebody, you know, I, I went through um, cancer surgery and when you're recovering, they give you painkillers, right? So they give you oxycodone or codeine or tramadol 
all of those things are painkillers. And there's a big epidemic in the world today of people that are addicted to painkillers. Well, painkillers are supposed to help you deal with pain. And it is because of trying to deal with that pain that people now end up, some people now end up being addicted to the painkiller. And some people now, and, and some people just look for that feeling. And that's why we have a, 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 an epidemic with, um, with just the way that painkillers make people feel. There's so many young people that are, are in that now. So you look for a counterfeit solution to the pain that you're feeling. And what you don't realize is that by accepting that, you're eventually toying with your own death. There's a story in the Bible about Samson, right? Everybody knows the story of Samson and Delilah. But if you go back, it's in Judges um, chapter 14 to 16. Before you get to the point of Delilah, you see that the problem with Samson actually started in his marriage. So Samson went, took a wife from a, uh, an area, you know, that, from the Philistines that he wasn't supposed to take because obviously they served a different God and he was just inviting all kinds of problems. So he made it, but guys, be very careful who you decide to marry. But that's, that's another sermon for another day. But in taking that wife, you know, he got into an issue with, with her people and, you know, he tried to scam them. They got him back. I don't have time to go through the whole story, but he was so angry about the way that they got him that he left her in her father's house after the wedding and just went home to cool off. Now, by the, what happens in Judges chapter 14, I think from verse 20, by the time he comes back, he finds out that they had given his wife to his best man, to the person at his wedding that was attending to him. They gave the wife, they thought he wasn't going to come back. They gave the wife in marriage to that person, so they wouldn't even let him see his wife. So he gets upset. He burns down their vineyards. They find out that it is him that burned down their vineyards. And then they go and they kill the wife and her father. Now Samson is really pissed, right? So Samson is upset. So he's, he's even more angry about this. Then he goes and kills a whole bunch of them. So it's this back and forth revenge plot. But while this is going on, Samson had this pain that he had not dealt with. So if you go to um, Judges chapter 16 in verse 1, it says Samson spent the night with a prostitute. So now here is somebody that is the, a child of destiny, a man that is a strong man that is meant to deliver Israel, and he's going to sleep with prostitutes. Now, the point that he slept with the prostitute, his strength hadn't left him. His destruction had not come. Because again, remember, it's a slow, gradual process. So, you know, he finishes with the prostitute. He comes out, he rips the gates of the town open and goes and dumps them on the hill. So he's still Samson. He's still in his place. But again, he's going down this dark path of bondage. And the next thing is that he gets involved with Delilah. And it was from the pain of his marriage that led him to the prostitute which led him to Delilah. And it's that gradual process. Now, by the time he gets into Delilah, it's, it's insane how Delilah is asking him, what's the secret to your power? And he's, he's gotten so comfortable that he cannot see. Again, remember what I said, bondage blinds you because he, he cannot see that this is my assassin. This is the person that is going to ruin me. This is the sin. This is the mistake. This thing is going to destroy my life. But because he can't see it, he's so comfortable, he's actually laying his head in the lap of his assassin, the very thing that will kill him, and he doesn't see it. In fact, when he finally reveals the true source of his power and the Philistines come and get him, what's the first thing that, that the Philistines did? Go and check it. They gouge out Samson's eyes because bondage wants to blind you. It wants to take away your vision of who you are meant to be. I, I, you know, if I had more time, maybe I'll take this on a Sunday in church, I'd, I'd really dig into this, but that's what bondage does, okay? So some men accept that that promiscuity or that porn or that drug addiction or that violence or that corruption or that failure or that depression, that thing, they, they've just accepted it about themselves and they can't see past that. And let me quickly go through the last three points because this is the good news. The good news is if you can get to the place where you see that freedom is possible, then it is possible for you. Because God, again, like the first question I asked, is do we want to be well? Do we want to be free? First step to freedom. Number one, repent. Okay, repentance in the Bible is taken from the Greek word metanoia, which simply means change your mind. Change your mind about your circumstance. Change what you see about yourself. See yourself the way that God sees you. Change your mind, believe it in your heart, and confess it with your mouth just like the prodigal son. He woke up and found himself in the pigsty. 
wishing for the food that pigs ate. And he said, man, this is not who I'm supposed to be. This is not who I'm, I'm my father's son. Even my father's servants don't live like this. Like, and so we wake up one day and we realize, man, I'm so far from the person God created me to be. And so when that switch happens in your mind, that's the first step to freedom, okay? Repent. The second step is return. Make the return leg of that trip. Now, sometimes people think that, oh, because I've accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior, or whatever the case may be, or I've said, God, I'm sorry, then my deliverance is instant. And sometimes it can be. But sometimes we just have to realize that just like the prodigal son, the journey into bondage, the journey into morality issues, the journey into that sin that you can't break free from was a gradual step. Remember we said destruction is gradual. And so you've put step in front of one step in front of the other for years. That now that you want to make the journey back, you have to accept that it might be a journey back. So it might not be instant. But all you have to do is you've repented, you've changed your mind. Just put one foot in front of the other and start walking back home. Make the return trip. The Bible says the father in the prodigal son story saw his son a long way off and he ran out to meet him there. Because, and it's a, it's a metaphor, it's a, it's a type of what God wants to do with us. He's just watching us to say, man, I just want this guy to, to just change his mind. I just want him to start making the journey back. I just want him to realize who I created him to be and just start putting one foot in front of the other. And once you do that, God is coming out there to meet us where we are, to lead us back home. Okay, but accept that it might be a journey. So you might fall again. You might make a mistake again. You might, it might not be instant. It might take you years. I struggled for years. I struggled with promiscuity. I struggled with pornography. I abused alcohol. I, I went through all of that. And it wasn't an instant quick fix, but I had to put one foot in front of the other. And if God can do it in me, then he can do it in you too. So make the return leg home. The last step in this, so repent, step one. Um, step two is return. And the last thing, and this is where I'll close, is refill. Let's go to, this is the last scripture I'm going to, I'm going to actually scroll to this so that you guys can see it. Matthew chapter 12, verse 43 to 45. All right, this is Jesus talking, and he says, when an impure spirit comes out of a person, it goes through arid places seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says, I will return to the house that I left. And when it arrives, it finds the house. Now pay attention to this. When the spirit arrives back in its original house, it says it finds the house unoccupied, swept clean, and put in order. And then it goes and takes with it seven other spirits more wicked than itself. And they go in and live in that house. And the final condition of that person is worse than the first. Now, the key there is that when you, when you do, are, when you are on this journey, right, to, I mean, you've repented, you've you started making the journey back home, you have to realize that the devil's not going to give up without a fight. So you ever see that people who are addicted to drugs and it seems like they're going to rehab and they're free, but then they end up worse than they started, or your depression the second time is worse, or your promiscuity, or your, you, you stumble and you fall again. Jesus told us that when the devil goes, when the spirit leaves, he's going to go and find other partners and come back and say, oh, mom, we're going to enter this place again. The key words there, Jesus said, is that it finds the house swept clean, put in order, and unoccupied, or empty. This is the third step. It's refill. You now need to fill the house, fill yourself, because the house is a metaphor for you. You have to fill yourself with godly content. You have to fill yourself with the word of God. When the devil came to tempt Jesus, how did Jesus reply? This is Jesus, the son of God, the Messiah, the Christ. Jesus said, it is written, it is written, it is written. With everything the devil brought to him, his response was the word of God. So whatever it is, whatever that sin is, whatever that mistake is, whatever that morality issue is, you now need to be intentional about spending time with God, about building a relationship with God, about reading your Bible, about listening to messages, about listening to godly music. You, you need to refill the house so that when the evil spirit comes back, it doesn't find the house empty. And that's the mistake most of us make. We, we have good intentions. We want to change. We want to fix ourselves. But we stop at the intentions. You got to stop at the place. You, you never stop refilling yourself. You continue to renew your mind and your spirit with the word of God. You continue to refill your house. And it is in that that freedom lies. 
if you leave your house empty, you might end up worse than you started. But if you refill yourself with God's word, with godly content, with the spirit of God every day, and you make a commitment to that, then freedom is possible. I'm a living testimony that there's nothing that God cannot change about a person. That there's no, just like my friend asked me, that how do you go from being like that to being like this? It's possible. And I'm not saying you need to become a preacher or a pastor. I've still not accepted the pastor title. You can ask Pastor Bless. So I'm not saying that you need to accept that. But I am saying that the, the, the full vision of God for you is possible. The full greatness, the full happiness in your marriage, in your business, in your career, in your health, that vision that God has for you as his son, it is absolutely possible. But you gotta, you gotta uh, repent. You gotta make the journey to return. And you have to be intentional about refilling yourself. And that's where I close.